there's a romantic lure for everybody to be focused on space travel. I think that we'd be better served if we focused instead on the Earth, and specifically the oceans. I'm Moni Chesterton, and this is Crowd Science from the BBC World Service. Listeners can ask us any question, and we find them a scientific answer. Listeners like Jack. My name is Jack Karolowski, and I live here in Davis, California. My question is, I'm wondering about the possibility of underwater cities. What would be the advantages and what would be the challenges of such an uh, venture? So if they were to build an underwater city, let's say 50 feet under the surface uh, in uh, the Gulf of Mexico, I think it would be fascinating. So in the next 50 years, could we be eating breakfast whilst watching the fish swim outside the kitchen window before heading off to work in an office under the ocean? So Jack wants to know how the science and engineering is coming along with making his dream a reality. And it isn't a new dream. The most ambitious project yet in ocean research has just started here in the sheltered bay of a beautiful West Indian island. Two up, two down the latest thing in detached underwater living. It contains everything to make a home for anyone who wants to live 50 feet beneath the surface of the sea. Called Tektite 2, it's the underwater base for a research project being run by a group of American universities with United States government backing. Decades on and we still aren't living under the sea. In fact, the longest anyone's spent living underwater in a fixed structure is 73 days. Meanwhile, many projects have fallen by the wayside, but the dream is not dead. In this programme, we're going to meet some of the oceanic pioneers and dreamers, which means a trip to Paris to meet ocean architect Jacques Rougerie. He believes that there's an underwater future for humans. He spent his first 10 years on the Atlantic coast of Africa, and the sea has never stopped being his life. We met at the tropical aquarium in the east of the capital, and as we stood next to this fish tank with all these beautiful fish from the Indian Pacific, I wondered what Jacques felt as he looked at this view. When I see this spectacle, it is really fantastic. It reminds me of my experience of living in an underwater house. I want to know more about you living underwater. How long did you live in an underwater house for? I am very lucky because I have lived underwater in different places around the world and at different depths. I've spent 48 hours right up to 69 days underwater. It was amazing because every time I discovered something new. By having this experience, I am a different person. My sensibility and point of view have changed and I have become a Merian. That means an inhabitant of the underwater world. So water is 70% of our planet, and do you think we've just been limiting ourselves to living on land? Is, are you saying the oceans have been overlooked? Yes, it's not that we've ignored it, but more that we didn't have the equivalent technology to go underwater that was allowing us to go into space. It's now that we are developing new technology for undersea using the resources that we can find under the water could help us in many ways, like in pharmacology or harnessing new forms of energy generation. How close are we to living underwater? When explorers try to discover the sea, they die, because the sea is dangerous. So I think there is a fight between explorers and the sea. We already have the tools, like the will and desire to do it. But the young generation don't have enough power, so it depends on money and politics. Jacques invited us to his boat on the River Seine, right in the heart of Paris, to look at some of his designs for underwater living, some of which have been built, like his first underwater house, Galate, and others, like his latest design, a half house, half boat called Sea Orbiter, which are waiting for the money to be built. I want to mention that on the deck of his boat is this sporty looking classic car boat thing which has actual propellers, tray cool.
Oh my god, you've got the tin tin shop. This is an incredible space and I'm really enjoying looking at the models of um, underwater places you've designed. Uh, when you're designing something that's underwater, what are the particular logistical problems that you face? For an architect, for an architect constructing underwater is very different from on land. And it's very hard, but that's also why it's wonderful. Underwater, there are different physics law, like Archimedes' law. On land, houses have a movement in the direction of the load, but in the water, it's the opposite, so you need to consider that. Also, the surrounding pressure varies enormously depending on the depth. So Jacques, uh, this uh, design, Galette, looks like nothing I've seen before. I look at the organic forms and work out how animals adapt to their surrounding. I can then recreate the same adaptation and so optimize the form and construction that way. So this is designed in the shape of a jellyfish to go deep and to consume low energy. How do you get clean air, electricity and drinking water in? Well, with an underwater house, how it functions will depend on its depth. One at 150 meters can leach up to a floating buoy, which would supply it with all the energy and air. This can create electricity or be where you collect food from. You have a cord with huge cables that comes from the buoy and links to the house. In the underwater house, you have all the normal comforts like a bathroom, toilet, shower. You have light, power for your computers, Wi-Fi. There are no issues. And how does the electricity come from the boat? The electricity is generated by solar and wind energy. And then do you make the air yourself? The air is pressurized with a compressor and pumped down at the same pressure as the water. The buoy also has a desalination system. So we're talking near future, Jacques, and you've mentioned the expense of safely living underwater. So if it's not for everyone, who is it for? There will be a greater penetration of man into the sea over time. Scientists will live in the sea and track its changes. But the underwater is not just for scientists, but it's for sea lovers in general, people who dream, who seek well-being, and who want to live with these beautiful, multicolored animals. Well, Jacques has managed to turn some of his designs into reality. Many of the more ambitious ones haven't made it past the drawing board. I wanted to get hold of someone dealing with the day-to-day -day of underwater life. Meet Roger. He's a hard man to get hold of. And I just want to share his answer phone message with you. Hi, this is Roger. I'm probably underwater or under pressure right now. So leave me a message and I'll call you when I get to the surface. Roger is an ex-military diver. He's in charge of operations at the Aquarius Reef Base. It's the world's only undersea research station, which currently sits in a sand patch five miles off America's Florida Keys. We grabbed a conversation in a rare moment when Roger was near a phone, and I asked him what the Aquarius is for. It was built and developed for oceanographic research. How big is your underwater laboratory? The Aquarius is about 42 feet long. She's about the size of a school bus. The Aquarius itself weighs about 80, 82 tons. The school bus sits around a depth of 50 feet and needs a support staff of around 12 people, one or two in the base itself, and the rest on the surface supporting the mission with maintenance and taking supplies in and out. Also remember, this is a 24-7 operation once we have people living inside, so we need to monitor the oxygen levels, the carbon dioxide levels, temperature, humidity, things like that. So this sounds intense. It is. You know, sometimes when people start thinking about living underwater for long term, it sounds great and all that, but it's not an easy thing to do and it's costly and expensive, to tell you the truth. We've had a lot of people who, who have these great ideas about living underwater, but I think Aquarius is one of the few places around the planet where we've found, we've found you and you're actually doing it. You are living the dream. And so I, I kind of want to know a bit more about 
what kind of changes for humans when we get underwater? The most noticeable one for your a average boat is, is perhaps a, a change in their voice. Not much because we're not very deep. That's because the air becomes denser. Physiologically, the most important thing, though, is that since you are, in this case, at two and a half times atmospheric pressure, you do take on more inert gas. And in this case, since the in, inside the Aquarius we just breathe normal air, you're going to take on more nitrogen. And depending on how long you stay in the Aquarius, that's going to incur some sort of decompression obligation. And what kind of other health challenges and what kind of things do you have to keep an eye on for people? One of the more common things that occur is what's called otitis externa, which is uh, an outer ear infection. And we keep things clean and, you know, of course we take showers and all that stuff and that helps reduce the risk. But it, it's so humid in there. So it's it makes, damp all the time. Yeah, it's, all, it's always humid, always damp, even just a little cut in that environment could get infected well, quite uh, quickly. So that's health, and I'm, I'm getting this picture of this damp bus-sized object 35 foot under the surface of the water. How on earth do you get everyday survival necessities, fresh air, fresh water, electricity? We have a buoy um, that is moored or tied over the over the Aquarius on the surface. You say buoy, I say boy. Either way, this floating structure is very similar to what architect Jacques was describing earlier, a life support system on the sea surface linked to the habitat with long cables, like an umbilical cord, which brings in the essentials like power, water and air. So you've got a pump in the air, you've got to pump in the energy, you need a ton of support staff. I've got to ask, uh, do you think this would work on a larger scale and, and do you think maybe an underwater city might be possible? You know, I know a lot of people like to think about that and maybe someday there, there's incredible technology that you can extract oxygen from the water that isn't very costly. Maybe one day there's technology where you can uh, remove the carbon dioxide from the air through through the seawater, which which is possible, but in a larger scale, it's not that easy. You know, there's aquaculture and all that stuff, and, and, and all that seems reasonable, and it is reasonable, but again, the amount of work and support to do that, right now from our experiences, you know, I mean, we have a, a piece of carbon steel in salt water with electricity. And it rusts, things break, it has to be maintained constantly. I mean, I'm talking constantly maintained. Roger gave me the details of the work maintaining Aquarius. It's a long list. The hoses break. Uh, they need, you have to buy materials constantly, but you have to change the carbon dioxide scrubbing of that. Any number of valves, uh, they leak, they break, have to be refilled. You know, it's just, and it just goes on and on and on. This is Crowd Science from the BBC World Service, and we're investigating whether humans can live in underwater cities. We've heard from a few brave souls who put in the hours, but it all sounds kind of cramped and uncomfortable, and it's hardly a city yet. We've heard from Roger how tough it is just to run the Aquarius, which is a mere household. So is the idea of a large-scale settlement just a pipe dream? Well, Phil Newton doesn't think so. He's a Canadian inventor specialising in underwater tech, and he has plans for a deep undersea colony. We sent BBC reporter Reagan Morris to his Vancouver-based inventor's lair. And Reagan, uh, what, what was his space like? It was fascinating. It's a big warehouse space full of his exosuits, these hard diving suits hoisted up, hanging all over the place, dozens of them that keep you at atmosphere. So there were submersibles, submarines, they're like little race cars, one and two person submarines that go down for Hollywood and NASA astronauts. It was quite exciting to see. And I was there to have him tell me about his dream for this underwater sea colony. He wants to create something called Vent Base Alpha, a city under the sea, and he's got real plans for it. You know, he thinks someday there'll be kids living under the sea saying, 
Mommy, Daddy, did people really used to live up there? Is that true? He believes it is possible and it is something that we'll be doing in the future. In the 1960s, all of us in this uh, deep ocean business believed, absolutely believed, that there would be cities under the sea in the next couple of decades, and of course that didn't happen. But the thing that makes what I want to do completely different than uh, anything that's been done before is that this colony will be of one atmosphere. The same pressure we're at right now, the same pressure we're designed to be at. So there you are, down let's say 3,000 feet, where the outside pressure is through 1,500 pounds per square inch. Now you can't step out there, I mean, wow, uh, you'd be in big trouble. We go to the top of Mount Everest, we go down to the bottom of the ocean. And we do it with technology, the armor of technology. And that allows us to go outside of our design specifications. We have the exosuits, the newt suits, all these atmospheric diving suits that we build, the small submarines, the deep workers, so we can live in our colony at uh, a comfortable uh, temperature, etc. We still have all of this stuff that we built years ago, and, and it uh, will never be used for saturation diving, as they call it, but uh, they'll be ideal for the prototype of uh, vent base alpha. So it's simply a cylindrical steel tank with a cap on each end, and uh, you can pressure it up, and it will allow you to um, stay down there for long periods of time. And just so I understand, if, say, we're all living under the sea, mm -hmm. and you're my neighbor, and I want to go see you, do I put on a suit? The colonies would all be joined together. So it would be like a giant uh, rat's maze, you know, in the uh, one atmosphere um, systems. And at periodic intervals, there are lockout chambers. That is, for example, if you wanted to go take a, a joyride around in your, your handy-dandy deep worker. So, Reagan, I'm just wondering, how on earth the basics like food, water and energy, how do they work if you're 3,000 foot under the surface? You can't just pop up for a sandwich. Uh, yes, I was wondering that too. You can't just pop up. Can you explain how you'll grow food, how you'll make electricity, how you'll breathe? So, how, how does all this work? I mean, it, it sounds like a grandiose plan, and it certainly is. It's very ambitious, no question. But uh, we call it vent base alpha because it'll have to be, I believe, it'll have to be built uh, in deep water where the thermal vents are escaping from the seafloor. And the reason for that is that uh, if you're going to build a colony, the one of the most important things, if not the most important thing, is power. And so we'd get it by putting a Stirling cycle engine, which is an engine that works on temperature differentials, on the seafloor. And here are these um, heat vents which spring up through the floor of, this, of the ocean. The temperature of these vents is upwards around 1,000 degrees F. The water surrounding them has an average temperature of about 46 degrees. That causes pistons to go up and down, that, and you turn generators with those pistons, and you have all the electricity that you need. And once we've got electricity, we can decompose water, literally decompose water, into hydrogen and uh, oxygen, because H2O is what water is. So if you take it apart, you get oxygen on one hand, hydrogen on the other. Hydrox, which they call it, is safe to breathe. All of that can take place. Uh, in this colony, and you'll be inside this colony at exactly the same pressure that we're at right now. I'd like to say that the breathing mixture Phil's talking about, hydrox, is extremely explosive, and breathing it can also cause hallucinations, so it isn't without problems. Now, Reagan, am I right in thinking the hydrothermal heat vents are really key to how this project works? I mean, I guess the clue's in the name, right? It, that's exactly right. It's how he envisions it being financially sustainable. Not only will the thermal vents provide energy for the sea colony down there, but he thinks that people living there will go out to work and mine these minerals, these liquid minerals, collect them and send them up to the surface to buyers who will pay a pretty penny for them up on Earth. So, Reagan, having met the man and heard him talking about his dream, I want to know whether you'd be signing up for it. Well, I'd love to go for a day or two. I don't think I'd want to go for any length of time unless there was some apocalyptic reason to go down. If it was an escape hatch, sure, I think I'd take Phil's colony over Mars. Mars, there's 
there's not really a plan C once you're up there. I think I'd prefer to be underwater eating lobster. Yep, I feel the same too. A deep sea colony sounds much closer to space travel, so isolated and dangerous. But if we're talking a shallower habitat in warmer tropical seas with nice views of bright fish and some daylight filtering down, that sounds doable. And this is exactly what Japanese construction firm the Shimzu Corporation have been designing together with the National Japanese Agency for Marine Earth Sciences and Technology. Finally, we have something on a city scale. They've gone big. The design looks like watery science fiction, a large globe built with concrete lattices and transparent acrylic plates. Now the top of the globe is above the surface of the water. The base is half a kilometre below and running through the core of the globe is a tower which strengthens the structure as well as being home, work and recreation space for 5,000 people. The globe is then attached to the sea bottom via a huge three kilometre deep spiral. Like Phil's vent base Alpha, they plan to use the temperature differentials to generate power. Phil wants to exploit thermal vents on the ocean floor, while the Japanese team uses the temperature difference between a warm sea surface and the cooler deep sea. This underwater city, called Ocean Spiral, comes with a projected price tag of $26 billion to construct. I call Masaki Takuchi from Shimzu Corporation to ask him why he thinks this is a price worth paying. We believe that we can utilize the capability of the deep sea and that's the purpose of this whole project. It's more or less like a small town which has hotels and amusement parks and offices and at the very bottom we have a research centre for deep sea. And Mr Takeuchi, why is it so vertical? I mean, it, it connects the surface to something you were saying three or four thousand metres down. Is there any particular and reason all... for that? So far, when we talk about utilizing the sea, we've been always looking at it horizontally. However, we believe um, it's more important to look at it vertically. For example, the sea surface and the deep sea has difference in water pressure. And by utilizing this difference, we can create desalination system. I've seen desalination plants in various places around the world and they're very expensive to run. They take a lot of electricity. Are you going to be able to do this in some sort of passive way? Normally, the desalination process uses reverse osmosis membrane in order for pressing the water to go through this membrane, normally it, um, we need electricity. However, this is where we are going to make use of the pressure difference in water from the surface and the bottom of the sea. And that way, we will not need much electricity. With this size of ocean spiral we are looking at at the moment, we can uh, create daily at 300,000 ton of water. Wow, so you can be a net exporter of fresh water. We are thinking we will be creating fresh water in the middle of the sea, like water spring. You've certainly taken the go big or go home approach to building an underwater city. I think this is the largest one I've, idea that I've seen. Thank you for that. But is it, is it ever realistically going to be built? This must be hugely expensive. That's correct. At the moment, we are thinking about uh, something like a new town in uh, 1,000 meter depth rather than 3,000 to 4,000 in the original plan. So, Mr. Takeuchi, when can I come and visit? Um, at the moment, uh, technically speaking, we are looking at 2030, but to actually have a factory and also uh, venues where tourists can visit in the deep sea, we 
think it's going to be around 2050 to realize this. So yeah, some sometime between 2030 and 2050, you can come and visit us. Yeah, 2050. We might see our first underwater cities emerging in 30 years time. I'll start saving for my holiday now then. The projects we've been dealing with seem fantastical and it's easy to dismiss fantasy as never gonna happen. But putting a man on the moon must have seemed that way before governments gave enough funding to make it a reality. And as populations rise and climate change makes parts of the world uninhabitable, I can see how someone with access to a big budget will decide to fund one of these engineering extravaganzas. So, listener Jack, in short, underwater living is doable, just expensive and difficult. Watch this space and please read the credits. This is Jack. You've been listening to Crowd Science with Marty Chesterton, produced by Melanie Brown. If you have a question for Crowd Science, email it in. The address is crowdscience at bbc.co.uk.